Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly series on innovations in the Department of Surgery. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Susan Tsai. Susan, thanks for joining me. And uh, many of you probably know Dr. Tsai by, by name, and obviously our topic today will be pancreatic cancer, which is her specialty. Uh, Susan is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She then went to medical school at the University of Michigan, where she stayed for her surgical training. She also spent two years at the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Cancer Institute, and then completed a surgical oncology fellowship at Johns Hopkins University prior to joining us here in Milwaukee. Uh, Dr. Sai has now been on our faculty for seven years. It's amazing how fast uh, time goes by and uh, really has distinguished herself as an expert in many areas of pancreatic cancer research and treatment. So it's a special treat to have her here today for this uh, video. Susan, thank you. Maybe we can start um, uh, by getting your thoughts and, uh, and comments for the audience on the incidence and risk factors for pancreas cancer. I think many people have the, the basic observation that, gee whiz, why did someone I love or someone I know get, get pancreas cancer? Yeah, I think that's one of the greatest challenges um, currently with, with treating pancreas cancer, Dr. Evans, is that the incidence of pancreas cancer is relatively low when you consider it in the spectrum of other very common diseases like lung cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. So annually, about 45,000 new cases of pancreas cancer um, occur every year, and then almost the equivalent number of patients actually mm -hmm. succumb to pancreas cancer. Um, we wish that we could figure out a good marker so that we could identify these patients early since it is such a devastating disease. But really, the only risk factor that's really well known is probably smoking and tobacco use. So certainly heavy tobacco use um, has been associated with an increased risk of cancer specifically pancreas cancer as well as lung cancer. But in addition to that, um, the other dietary factors that we often talk about modifying are just um, the things that you would hear from your primary care physician every day, lose weight, exercise, a sedentary lifestyle, and obesity certainly are also linked to it. Yeah. But really the majority of patients uh, develop pancreas cancer for no apparent reason that we know of. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the frustrating thing. And they're, they're most commonly, um, you know, they, there is a prodrome where patients can have unexpected weight loss in the middle of their life and then um, develop new onset diabetes. And sometimes people think that that's normal. People are developing diabetes in middle life. But in the setting of weight loss, that's really incongruous and really is a a very concerning sign of possible and occult pancreas cancer. So the, so the problems with the blood sugar being a little high or so-called diabetes, that usually occurs in, in concert or in parallel to weight gain. So you're saying if the blood sugar goes up but the weight goes down, think that the pancreas may be a, may be a problem then. Certainly. I, I think I just saw um, someone who's a delightful 91-year-old who um, presented with a 100-pound weight loss and worsening diabetes. And, of course, you know, people thought, well, this is just, you know, you're, you're having worsening diabetes. We're telling you to lose weight. You're losing weight. And they think that that's normal, but that's sure. really not. It's pathologic. Well, many of our patients, probably most, have uh, tremendously loving and supportive families. Mm -hmm. One of the questions the family members frequently ask is, can this be inherited? Mm -hmm. And this is one of your s specific areas of, of unique expertise. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, the, about fact and fallacy within, with the issue of, of inheritance risk. Yeah. So, you know, this is an area that's certainly evolving. Um, we estimate probably 10 to 15 percent of pancreas cancers are related to um, a known genetic mutation that we've already, we know of and have de described. So these heritable mutations would be something like BRCA2, which is the most common. BRC, the BRCA gene for the breast. The BRCA gene for breast uh, cancer, breast and ovarian, hereditary breast and ovarian syndrome. Um, HNPCC, otherwise known as Lynch syndrome, that's associated with colon cancer. Um, ATM mutations, which are relatively newly described. Um, and others such as P16, otherwise known as CDK uh, N2A, which is a, um, a, a genetic mutation associated with both pancreas and melanoma can uh, within the family. 
So there are certainly some known mutations that we could detect and maybe know from a family pedigree that exists, but there are certainly other patients who have some kind of genetic predisposition that we just have not really identified the gene. And in those cases, we usually say there are two first-degree family members who are affected with pancreas cancer or three any-degree family members uh, who are affected with pancreas cancer. So in general, the general population, the risk would be approximately 1%, lifetime risk of developing pancreas cancer. And in patients who have two or more first-degree or three or more any-degree relatives, that escalates to over 10%. Wow. And, and we probably won't have time to get to this during this video, but you do run um, one of the country's very few screening programs for patients who, are, who may potentially be at high risk. And, and certainly, uh, for those of you watching this video, you can contact Dr. Sai or her office if you feel like you may be uh, a member of a, of a high-risk family for whatever reason. I wanted to also get to... Um, Assume the patient has now been diagnosed. We know it's a pancreas cancer. If, unfortunately, it's spread to other parts of the body, then chemotherapy or a clinical trial would be used. If it's localized to the pancreas, what are the options for that patient? Well, you know, I think historically we've always said that surgery is the only cure for cancer. Uh, for pancreas cancer, and I think certainly it's it's necessary for pancreas cancer, um, but it, in and of itself, probably an incomplete treatment. And so, as you know, Dr. Evans, having done you know the majority of the work in this, we really recommend to patients that they have multimodality therapy. So that really means that there's um, a component of systemic therapy for the cancer that we perhaps can't see on a CT scan, but are suspecting is lingering. Um, radiation therapy to really ensure at the time of surgery that we remove all the cancer that's there, and then the surgery itself to remove the bulk of the tumor. And most of the, not all, but, but most of the tumors occur in the, in the uh, right side, the patient's right side of the gland, which is the head of the pancreas. And I think many people who are watching this video have heard of the so-called Whipple operation. Mm -hmm. So what is the, is the Whipple operation? So um, the pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ, and it's situated in an area that is really, I would just say, high real estate. So um, not only is the pancreas intimately involved, usually with the cancer, but other organs such as the bile duct, um, the uh, intestine, sometimes uh, even the vasculature around that area. And there are critical um, blood vessels that run through that area. Um, so the Whipple procedure is the process of actually removing that very delicate, those very, very delicate structures, and then um, performing, an, uh, basically recreating the normal anatomy um, surgically. That operation, um, as you know, takes probably about three to four hours just to remove the tumor, and maybe another three hours to reconstruct. So it's a rather intensive operation. Sure, patients have to be healthy enough to undergo the surgery. I think certainly some of the areas that, um, that you and the entire team have looked at here is focusing on how to combine surgery with chemotherapy, with radiation. Um, oftentimes this is part of a clinical trial. Maybe you could say a few words about why clinical trials exist and many people, many people who will watch this video have heard of the term clinical trial, but they don't, for example, they don't quite uh, know exactly what that entails. Um, you've uh, completed a couple really neat clinical trials with innovative new treatments combined with standard chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Maybe a few words on a clinical trial and um, maybe even describe, for example, a clinical trial that you have open now. Mm -hmm. So um, I really actually can't do this topic justice. I think probably you could ans answer this better than I could. Um, but just for perspective for patients to kind of think about, when historically when patients were treated with a surgery first approach, the median overall survival after surgery was approximately 24 months. And that is in an incredibly reproducible number that has been replicated over decades. So over 30 years, there really hasn't been a change in the way that we treat pancreas cancer in terms of the overall survival, very minimal improvements. So just made. simply operating on the patient, taking the tumor out, unfortunately the cancer comes back in most patients. Exactly. Um, and so actually you, one of your first clinical trials was to actually examine alternative ways to think about um, how we can treat 
these patients better since we haven't really made much progress historically. And it's really looking at the patient as a whole and understanding that there's a systemic process to the disease and even though we're um, very tempted to treat the cancer that we can see, there's definitely cancer that we can't see that needs mm -hmm. to be treated. So in that context, that is how we actually structure a clinical trial. There is a question um, that's developed, and then the, the trial is aimed at answering that question. So for example, does neoadjuvant therapy improve the survival of patients with resectable pancreas cancer? Um, and, and certainly you have answered that in your previous clinical trials, and we know uh, from our experience here, um, extrapolating from the experience at MD Anderson, that the survivals of resectable patients with resectable pancreas cancer now exceed 44, 46 months. So that's more than almost doubling the mm. median overall survival of a surgery-first approach. Um, building on that, you know, foundation, what we've done is actually try to improve uh, the management of um, neoadjuvant therapy so that it, it's really effective in all patients. So, for example, a recent clinical trial that we have uh, closed to accrual in the last um, probably two months looks at personalizing the therapies of neoadjuvant therapies uh, for, for patients. So. I think people may, may not understand that you and I may have, if we had cancers, would have very different cancers. If we went in to see a medical oncologist, we would get probably the same chemotherapy, right. even though in, inherently we are very different people and our cancers are probably very different themselves. So this trial was aimed at actually taking samples from the tumor and then actually looking at the expression of those tumor cells to decide which chemotherapies they would be more sensitive to which ones would be more effective, and applying those in a neoadjuvant setting prior to surgery. Um, you know, uh, many patients who, um, who unfortunately develop pancreas cancer uh, will not live uh, one or two miles from a large medical center like this. And they're oftentimes uh, uh, um, confronted with the challenge of, do I, can I get my treatment perhaps closer to home? Uh, if they're older in age and they say they're retired, uh, they're somewhat uh, dependent uh, to some degree on their spouse maybe to drive. Uh, their adult children are, are very helpful but oftentimes may live in other parts of the United States. Uh, and, they're, and they're struck with that challenge of do I get treated at my smaller hospital uh, close to my house uh, or do I go to a larger medical center um, where pancreatic cancer treatment is an everyday event. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you and I both uh, struggle in our conversations with patients, but what is, what is your approach to uh, talking to patients about this? I, I know that um, this has been a subject that has been studied really since the LeapFrog group first yeah. looked at this in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But there's still, I think, other than the issue involving physicians and doctor preference, what advice would you give to patients who are, who are uh, grappling with this? Yeah, well, um, it's just such a complex disease, and, and you can tell that it's a complex disease because from the very beginning, we're telling patients that not one surgeon or one uh, physician can take care of the entire disease process. And so multiple physicians are required to manage this disease, and actually multiple other additional support staff are needed as well, mm -hmm. dietitians, uh, geneticists, um, endocrine specialists. So there really is a huge amount, it takes a village really to treat patients with pancreas cancer. And it's very understandable to, to, under, to see why patients wouldn't want to travel far distances for care. I think it has to be given in the perspective, though, of the long-term treatment. So um, if I told someone you would have to travel a certain amount of time, uh, let's say a, a finite amount of time, two months for this care, and then the the chance that you would have a complication or, or some other risk associated with the treatment <coughs> might be um, less because of that, because you're getting a treatment at a high volume center that's very familiar with all the different nuances of the disease. Mm. Or you could get that treatment closer to home, but then potentially have to have a longer treatment or even have to travel after that treatment because of additional unforeseen complications. Um, in the end, I think most patients would probably choose to put in the investment in getting their treatment at a high volume center. Sure. Um, just because down the road it, it may pay dividends. And in many cases, uh, treating certain diseases, certainly doing surgery, not that different from, from shooting foul shots in basketball. The, 
the more you practice, probably the, the more that you will get in. And certainly in medicine, we know with respect to safety and outcome, um, the volume seems to matter. In yeah. other words, the, the experience that everyone gets, not just you, because you obviously have dedicated your life to this disease, but the nurses, the technicians, the um, people who manage uh, the blood sugars or the diabetes management, the nutritionists, mm -hmm. uh, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, that we always talk about that there's an art and a science uh, to medicine. And I think sometimes some aspects of the on oncologic care can be more science and certainly maybe could be not necessarily delivered immediately at the, the, um, the principal site. Um, but s there are some things that are undeniably technique um, and skill driven. And of course, surgery is one of those things. And also radiation oncology, I would say, is something that is very much experience and technique driven and is more of an art than a science and so that may not be translatable it's not just um, something that can be just rec recapitulated at another institution sure well maybe my last question and I didn't um, I didn't prepare uh, prepare you for this but I just thought of it as we were as we were doing this um, as we were doing this video is where do you think we're going to be in um, in five or perhaps ten years in the treatment of pancreas cancer. I mean, obviously the progress in the last s seven, eight years has, has really been uh, quite encouraging. And where do you think that we might be, even at the in, the, in your most optimistic and hopeful view, where do you think we might be in, in five to seven years? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we've been pleasantly surprised in the last five years that um, there are systemic agents that are actually quite effective for pancreas cancer. The problem is that it's a very resistant disease, and, and even though you can get a good response initially, things can come back. I think where we have room to improve, and I think there's a lot of work being done in this, is being able to understand when we are effectively treating patients so that we can minimize toxicities and maximize response. And that's a little bit down the road of biomarker development and being able to really understand when we have reached maximum treatment efficacy and maybe it's either time to take a break or to change therapies. Great, great point. So basically, knowing really quickly after you've started treatment, treating someone, whether it's working, mm -hmm. and then also knowing when you've gotten your, your biggest bang for the buck, mm -hmm. essentially. Yep. And then, and then finally, of course, we'd love to see, I mean, it's, it's very rare, but we actually have a growing cadre of patients who are five, six, seven years out. And we love to see that, but we'd love to see everyone reach that, that stage. And a little bit of that has to do with understanding why cancers recur. So that's a huge area of interest, and in, you know, whether that's in stem cell biology and understanding how we can maybe get not only at the cancer itself, but at the, the very seminal cells that, that um, give rise to future cancers. If we can tackle that, that would be obviously a game-changing um, event. Wow. Well, Susan, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I think this information hopefully has uh, provided all of you uh, a, a background and a beginning for further research on pancreatic cancer and possible treatments. Dr. Sai's contact information will follow the end of this video. Uh, thank all of you for joining us this afternoon.